Hello and welcome to Baiju's exam prep IAS. Before we start with our today's analysis, a quick gentle reminder. Baiju's exam prep IAS has already launched its official telegram channel. What is that you have to do? Follow the link given in the description box or scan this QR code. This will take you to our official telegram channel. Join the channel so that you get all the current affairs related updates. Let's get started and look into the first article. The first article says over the top. The article here is speaking about the draft telecommunication bill. Let us try and understand what are the key features of this draft telecommunication bill. We will also look at criticisms with respect to this bill as well. First up, why did the government of India come up with the introduction of this bill? That is because if we look into the statistics, with 117 crore subscribers, India is the world's second largest telecommunication ecosystem. Which is the first? Please put it on the comment section. The telecommunication sector employs more than 4 million people and contributes about 8% of the country's GDP. We have one of the major laws that currently regulates the telecommunication sector. That happens to be the Indian Telegraph Act. Apart from the Indian Telegraph Act, we also have the Indian Wireless Telegraph Act of 1933. We also have the Telegraph Wires Unlawful Protection Act of 1950. When you look into these laws, these are very traditional. They are very historical. They are not updated with the changing times as well. When you look into the current generation, we have the 4G, we have the 5G, we have multiple services which are not covered under any of these laws. And in order to do away with these British era laws governing the telecom sector, we have the Department of Telecommunication which has issued the draft Indian Telecommunication Bill of 2022. So basically, we have Internet of Things, we have Industry 4.0, we have Mobile Edge Computing, all of this and other major services are not included under these three major laws. So to make sure that all the services are covered, what we have is the introduction of this new bill. When we look into this draft telecommunication bill, it has some important definitions. What are those? One is to do with telecommunication. The term telecommunication has been defined to mean transmission, emission or reception of any messages, whether by wire, radio, optical or other electromagnetic systems. This is how the bill defines telecommunication as. Then we have the telecommunication services. This has been defined to include broadcasting services, electronic mail, voicemail, voice, video and data communication services, audio tech services, video tech services, fixed and mobile services, internet and broadband services, satellite based communication services, internet based communication services, in flight and maritime connectivity services, interpersonal communication services, machine to machine communication services, over the top communication services, which is made available to users by telecommunication. Now the question is, when we speak about over the top communication services, what are these over the top communication services. This is simply called as the OTT platform. What is this OTT platform? Let's say for example, we have the Amazon Prime or let's take the example of Netflix. These are considered as the OTT platforms. Initially, when they came into picture, all that they were trying to do is act as the platforms where number of programs would be hosted on it, number of movies would be hosted on it. But over a period of time, they also started engaging with the production houses and they started releasing their own web series, short movies, so on and so forth. So when we speak about OTT platforms, it includes Amazon, Netflix, so on and so forth. Such is all also brought under the ambit of telecommunication services. Under the telecommunication services, historically, we did not have WhatsApp, Telegram, Signal, so on and so forth in the present era. What we have is new messaging platforms. So these messaging platforms like WhatsApp, Telegram and Signal is also added as part of the telecommunication service. Then we have the telecommunication network, which means a system or series of systems of telecommunication equipment, telecommunication infrastructure or both including terrestrial or satellite networks or submarine networks or a combination of such networks used are intended to be used for providing telecommunication services but shall not include customer equipment. These are the various definitions that are given as part of the telecommunication bill. So remember the Indian telecommunication bill 
basically has an aim to consolidate all the existing laws and also come up with development expansion operation of the telecommunication services in India. What are the key features of this particular legislation? When you look into this legislation, the bill recognizes the globally established principle of exclusive privilege of the central government in relation to the telecommunication services, telecommunication network, telecommunication infrastructure and spectrum. So once you consider the seven schedule, what we have is the state list, central list, that is the union list and also concurrent list. Communication as one of the entry items is present under the central list. So it is the central government which is drafting this legislation so that it is able to take care of all the telecommunication services as well as the equipment. The bill gives provision to direct that any communication to or from any person relating to any particular subject transmitted or received by any telecommunication network shall be suspended in the interest of sovereignty, integrity or security of India, friendly relations with foreign states, public order or preventing incitement to an offence. What do we mean by it? Let's say for example, there is a person who is wanting to send a message from the source to the destination, that is from one person to another. We also have article 19 as well. Article 19 speaks about freedom of speech and expression. But is freedom of speech and expression absolute? No. There are reasonable restrictions imposed. Such reasonable restrictions is also brought into the picture. So this feature goes on to say that if a person is sending a message and if this message is threatening any of the features, then such a message can be withheld by the government of India. So this particular bill proposes that messages shall not be transmitted. So if a person sends a message, such a message will not be transmitted or it shall be intercepted or it can also be disclosed to an authorized officer as well. Such an authorized officer will look into it and if he feels that if it is violating any of it, public order preventing incitement, then such a message can be barred as well. This is where we have a major concern. What is the major concern? Let's say for example, we have WhatsApp or let's take the example of Telegram. They are end-to-end -end encrypted. Let's say if a person is sending a message on WhatsApp, let's say I am sending a message to you, it is end-to-end -end encrypted. So only both of us would be able to read it. But because this particular provision has brought into telecommunication bill, WhatsApp and Telegram or any other messaging platform in the near future, which has this end-to-end -end encryption, will have to reveal the data. If they are revealing the data, it also means it is violating the privacy of that individual as well. What if it is not a threat? In that case, the person's privacy is getting breached. We also know for the fact that from the Puttaswamy judgment, right to privacy also became important aspect of right to life as well. In this particular backdrop, if the government is intercepting the message or it is being read by the authorized officer, this is violating the privacy as well. Besides, it can also be manipulated as well. It can also be misused by the authorities as well. So who is going to keep a check on these authorities is another major question that is asked under this article. Then what we have is the Telecom Regulatory Authority of India. The central government is also planning to amend the Telecom Regulatory Authority of India Act basically to dilute this particular function of the recommendatory body. What is that function? The currently, the TRAI Act mandates the telecom department to seek regulator's view before issuing a new license to a service provider. The proposed bill does away with this provision. What do we mean by it? We have the telecom department. The telecom department, if it has to give license permission to another service agent or the service provider, it has to seek the recommendation of the Telecom Regulatory Authority of India. But what is the government planning to come up with? That this particular power that is given to TRI will be diluted and the department can take its own recommendation and it can also give license to to the service provider. As of now, the service provider license will have to be taken from the TRAI, but in the near future, the telecom department will be able to do it independently without the recommendation from the Telecom Regulatory Authority of India. The next feature is with respect to bank 
bankruptcy. What do we mean by it? Let's say for example, there is a particular company. This company goes through the proceedings of insolvency. It does not have the money to run the company as well. In this particular backdrop, there was lack of clarity on whether the spectrum owned by this defaulting operator belongs to the central government or banks will take care of it. Banks will take over it. In this particular backdrop, the Department of Telecommunication has proposed that if a telecom entity in possession of spectrum goes through bankruptcy or insolvency, the assigned spectrum will revert to the control of the center. So there was a grey area in the earlier legislations. This is being answered by the central government. And when it comes to the license as well, if there is a scenario of breach of license, we have the Department of Telecommunication which can also revoke such license licenses, registration, authorization or assignment and can also impose a penalty. So if a license is given to one of the service provider and in case they breach this license, penalty can be imposed on them and their license can also be revoked as well. And to make sure that all this is expedited, we also have the alternate dispute resolution mechanism which will also be established by the government. Then what we have is the telecommunication development fund. The draft bill proposes to rename the Universal Service Obligation Fund as Telecommunication Development Fund. The US4 fund is generated from the annual revenue of telecom services providers. The sum of money received towards the TDF will first be credited to the Consolidated Fund of India. So the fund will be used for increasing the connectivity in the rural, remote and urban areas. The money that is collected will also help in research and development in the telecommunication area and added to it. Skill development, introduction of new telecommunication services will be undertaken with the funds that is present in the telecommunication development fund. So this article currently goes on to say that these are some of the important features. However, the article goes on to say because the government is breaching the privacy, it has to re-look into some of the important features of this legislation is what is this article all about. Now let's look into the next article. This article says soft power the new race every country wants to win. When we consider the foreign policy, there are two types of power. One is what is called as the hard power. The other is what is called as the soft power. What is this hard power? Let's say for example, if a country is making use of the military to get its own ambitions and objectives done is what is called as the hard power. Let's say for example, United States of America goes and fights a war on any other country. So it is asking that country particular country to follow the rule book of United States of America. Hence, it is waging a war. Such a war where military power is made use of is what is called as the hard power. In the present situation, we can also take the Russian invasion of Ukraine. The Russian invasion of Ukraine is an example of hard power. Similarly, economic sanctions is also an aspect of hard power. We have United States of America, which has imposed sanctions on Iran. We have United States of America along with NATO which has imposed sanctions on Russia as well. So economic sanctions will also be part of this area of hard power. Then another type of power in the foreign relationship is what is called as the soft power. As American political scientist Joseph Nye said in the late 1980s, it is the power of attraction through culture, political ideas and policies rather than coercion that military hard power exhibits. What is this soft power? When it comes to the hard power, what we are making use of the military strength, we are making use of the economic sanctions, but but when it comes to the soft power, we are making use of the cultural values. We are making use of cuisine of that particular country. We are making use of the value system of that particular country, the spiritual aspect of that particular country. We are making use of the Bollywood movies, the Hollywood movies and many other types of movies so that people are attracted to that country. So in hard power, we make use of hard hitting military power, economic sanctions so that the the country falls in line with the country's objectives but in soft power we are making use of different approach so that we can appeal to the people and ultimately they do respect the notions of the country. If you consider India what are some of the examples of soft power? What we can make use of is the music. Music, Bollywood music, Hollywood music, 
टॉलीवुड म्यूजिक सैंडलवुड म्यूजिक मॉलीवुड म्यूजिक इज एन इम्पॉर्टेंट एस्पेक्ट of what is called as the soft power there are ample amount of examples where some of the songs are even played in africa as well there is a book called as pax indica which is written by shashi tarur ji he goes on to say that afghanistan women were so addicted to the indian serials as well so indian serials can also act as a soft power as well indian movies are also acting as the soft power for example dangal which happened to be one of the important movies that india came up with also speaks about the father and the daughter relationship it also speaks about the love for the sports as well this became a major hit in china so movies can also become an aspect of soft power cuisine can also become an aspect of soft power so soft power is basically making use of the cultural values that is existing in that particular country so that you can push an agenda in a foreign country and the foreign country just listens to it not because you have the hard power but because you have the cultural aspects that is integrated into our system this is what is called as soft power another major aspect of soft power happens to be sports and this article here is basically speaking about how sports and major mega events of sports can be used as what is called as the soft power if we look into the recent examples we have neeraj chopra who won an olympic gold medal in men's javelin throw is now a household name at the commonwealth games 2022 indian athletes won 61 medals including 22 gold so the author goes on to say that sport which is an aspect of soft power is currently being used by most of the countries so that they can send their message across the globe as well so this article basically Kali goes on to say that whether sports as a soft power has it been successful or not, whether Olympics or World Cups or any other important major events that is taking place around the world has it had any impact on the soft power or not. So we have statistics which go on to say that Dong Feng Liu, international professor of sport management for the Shanghai campus of the Sport Business School, surveyed French citizens in 2020. He was also international professor sport business schools in France on China's performance in the Olympics and their impressions about China based on its rising medal count he found that a country's olympic achievement has a positive ef- effect on its national soft power so basically the number of medals won by China clearly pointed out that it was able to be successful in the sports in certain events as well and ultimately this created a positive image about china when questions were asked in france so, and at the same time when you look at china china is also an authoritative country if you look at russia or north korea there are instances where they are acting as an authoritarian regime so india is not an authoritarian regime what we have is a beautiful democracy everyone has voice in the system so such a negative image like china will not have any effect on india so india has to make sure that it expands on its sports front says this article so this article currently goes on to say that if we are speaking about china what china is been able to do is increase the people to people relationship with multiple countries that is through the association of sports similarly india would also have to learn lessons from china so that even it can enlarge the people to people relationship via sports the author goes on to say athletes from african countries such as madagascar are trained in swimming badminton table tennis etc in china which helps beijing create a positive impact on a wider population and result in better formal relations as well there is also china's memorandum of understanding with countries such as kenya so the chinese runner can train with kenyan athletes as they are among the best in the world when it comes to long distance running so this article currently goes on to say what we also have to do in the near future is take lessons from china enter into agreements with multiple countries so that we can learn from them and at the same time we would also be able to give back as well now let us see what india has been able to achieve in the past when it comes to the olympics what we have is a massive population but the number of medals that we are able to win is far less so in order to overcome these issues what we have is number of initiatives taken by the government of india in 2014 we have 
have the Ministry of Sports which launched the Target Olympic Podium Scheme to improve India's performance at the Olympics and Paralympics. This is an extra monetary assistance and training from the best national and international coaches. Because of this initiative, we were able to improve our medal tally as well and at the same time, in 2016, a Niti Aayog report came up with a 20-point plan to improve India's Olympic performance. The report said, India still lacks a favourable atmosphere for sports to polish the skills of early stage athletes. So this basically means that from the early age, we are not motivating the children. What we are pushing them is only towards the education. We do not have the infrastructure. We do not have the support from the family members. We do not have support from the teachers. And the most important factor is, we all know for the fact that even the sports class or what we have, the PTs, even that is taken by the mathematics teacher and the science teacher as well. So how will we have the Olympic medals? So Niti Ayo clearly goes on to say that this has to change. Family orientation has to change. So an awareness has to be brought about in this particular backdrop. A reply in Parliament 2018 said that India spends only 3 paise per day per capita on sports. In contrast, China spends 6.1 per day per capita. These are some of the other issues that we may have to address. Only when we are able to pump in the money, we would be able to get what is called as medals. And if we get the medals, what we are able to send is a message to the global community about the soft power of India. So when you consider the mega sporting events, the London 2012 Olympics and Paralympics, which was watched by more than 50% of the world's population, generated a substantial boost in international interest in the United Kingdom. The International Olympic Committee claimed that Tokyo Olympic Games was watched by 3.5 billion people, a 74% increase in digital viewers from Rio 2016. FIFA estimated that 3.5 billion people tuned in to watch 2018 World Cup in Russia with an estimated 1.12 billion speculators for the final. This basically means that such mega events have been able to bring people together and it has created its own soft power in the foreign policy. So what is the advantage of sports mega events when it comes to the soft power? Whenever we are speaking about hard power, what exactly happens? There is bloodshed, then there is cost of military as well. People will have to be mobilized. So hard power may get the objectives done. But what it involves is large bloodshed, hatred, hate that is spewing out. As we see in Russia, invasion of Ukraine, what we have is number of people lost their lives and property as well. So when it comes to hard power, you may get the objective met. But then what we actually see is lot of bloodshed when it comes to the war. But if it is through the soft power, what we will have is more love, respect towards the opposition. What we will have is more respect towards another country. And this will create a positive image about that country. So this is the first major advantage of the soft power added to it. And whenever we have such sporting events that take place in a particular country, this will also give boost to the tourism as well the positive image of that country is created and ultimately it will generate more money for the country hosting it this will further increase friendship and camaraderie as well let's take the example we have the india pakistan rivalry but we also know for the fact that virat kohli is loved in pakistan we also have the recent example as well let's say we have the tennis we have rafael nadal who was crying for roger federer this left the internet heart broken as well. This basically means that when you have opposition fighting against each other, you also increase the camaraderie, you also increase the sportsmanship and ultimately, if there are issues between countries, this can also be diluted over a period of time. That is the positive outcome of sports as the soft power. So what are the measures that we may have to take in the near future? India should start concentrating on foreign MOUs with nations that excel in specific ports. The aim should be to train Indian players overseas. For example, Australia and United Kingdom can assist in swimming given their standing here. When it comes to running, negotiating collaborative training agreements with African countries such as Kenya would be ideal. There should be no politics in seeking or even offering the assistance. Take this example too. China has requested Indian assistance in improving cricket development 
development in China. If China is able to do it, we should also request other countries so that our medal tally will increase over a period of time. Second, TOPS China 2 had a similar scheme as well, has demonstrated that focusing on few sports is beneficial for a country such as India, which is striving to enhance its sporting abilities and standing. Third, private investment needs to be harnessed to develop infrastructure. The better a country performs in sporting events, the greater a sports person interest in the sports atmosphere. This also creates a huge market for the private players to invest in it. So the government of India should make sure that all this is taken into picture and then sports is promoted as a soft power of India. It is this that we have to understand with respect to this article. Now let's look into the next article. This article says midday meal related food poisoning cases at 6 year peak. Let us try and understand what is this article all about. First, let us have a bird eye view about midday meal. What is this midday meal scheme? It is a meal that is provided to the children enrolled in the government schools, government aided schools, local body schools, special training centers, madrasas, maktabs, supported under Sarva Shiksha Abhyan. So what is the objective? To increase the enrollment of children belonging to the disadvantaged sections, leading enrollment to increase attendance in the schools, to retain children studying in classes 1 to 8, to provide nutritional support to the children of the elementary stage in drought affected areas. So these are some of the important objectives that have to be met by the midday meal scheme. Some of the salient features include world's largest school meal program aimed at attaining goal of universalization of primary education. The Ministry of Education is the authorized body to implement the scheme. It is a centrally sponsored scheme. Hence, cost is shared between the center and the states and state share is 60%. This is not uniform for the northeastern states and the hilly states. It may vary as well. What is this article currently speaking about? The article goes on to say that there are children who have consumed food that is prepared under the midday meal scheme. Once they have consumed, what they have seen is food poisoning and they had to be admitted. So for the past few years, what we have seen is spike of these numbers and in 2022, what we have seen is major incidents surfacing in India. So this article goes on to say that the cases of food poisoning due to the consumption of the mid midday meals have resurfaced. Let's look into the statistics. In the past 90 days, close to 120 students suffered from food poisoning across schools in Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh and Bihar. In 2022, 979 victims of food poisoning were reported in schools across India, the highest in the last six years. The number declined during the pandemic years as the schools were closed. So this article goes on to say that this number is continuously increasing over a period of time. If we look into the data as given in the chart one, for the year 2016, it peaked up to 1,398. For the year 2022, as of now, it is about 979. So children who have consumed the meal have gone through the food poisoning and they have become the victims of the food poisoning. What are the ways that food poisoning is happening? Close to 12% of such victims become ill after consuming midday meals in which lizards, rats, snakes and cockroaches were also found. And most of these cases were recorded in Karnataka, Odisha, Telangana, Bihar, Andhra Pradesh as well. If you look into the statewide split of the victims in 2009 to 2022 period, in Bihar it was about 950, in Odisha it was about 1327, Telangana it was about 1092, Karnataka 1524, Andhra Pradesh 794, Tamil Nadu 132, so on and so forth. So it is the children who have become the victims of the food poisoning as well. What has the Comptroller and Auditor General spoken about this midday meal scheme? The Comptroller and Auditor General has clearly said that such issues are persisting because of the poor infrastructure, insufficient funds, irregular licensing, limited reporting as well as absence of the feedback mechanism. So if you look into the issues in the year 2015 and 16 in Madhya Pradesh, the CAC found that around 14,500 schools did not have a kitchen shed for preparing the midday meals. So whenever you have to prepare the meals, what you require is the kitchen. What you also require is the infrastructure. What you also require is the utensils for the same. So this was not present in Madhya Pradesh. In Arunachal Pradesh, 
Pradesh, 40% of the schools did not have a shed back in the year 2016. In Chhattisgarh, a CAG survey clearly pointed out between financial year 11 and financial year 15 found that midday meal was cooked in unhygienic conditions. Next, what we have to look into is the temperature. When food is delivered from the centralized kitchens to schools, should have a minimum temperature of 65 degree when it is served. This is not happening because many schools do not have the facility to check the temperature. Then if you are speaking about the grievance readdressal mechanism, in 2014 in Jharkhand, the CAC found that a grievance redressal mechanism was absent in schools and so reports about children falling sick were not addressed and recorded. Then we have the license and registration certificates. In 2017 in Himachal Pradesh, the CAC found that license and registration certificate were given to 97% and 100% of the FBOs respectively without inspecting their premises. If the food is prepared outside and then brought into the schools, wherever the food is prepared, their hygienic conditions will have to be checked, their infrastructure will have to be checked, such is not checked, but the licenses are given on the own without looking into the basic amenity check, says this article. These are some of the concerns. So these concerns will have to be addressed is what is this article all about. Now let's look into the next article. This article says, India Inc. needs a neurodiverse workplace. Let us try and understand what is this article all about. First, we have to understand the meaning of neurodiversity. What is this neurodiversity? It is the workplace which refers to including people with neurodivergent conditions such as attention deficit or hyperactivity disorder and autism spectrum disorder, dyslexia, dyspraxia, dyscalgia as well as Asperger's syndrome. So if there are people suffering from it, should they be part of the work culture or not? This article currently goes on to say, for the past few years, what we have been hearing is words such as inclusion and diversity. If the real meaning has to be given to inclusion and diversity, we have to make sure that such people are also included in the work culture. A 2019 McKinsey study revealed that companies with gender diversity were 25% more likely to have above average profitability, while those with ethnic diversity outrivaled their competitors by 36%. Another report titled India's Best Workplaces in Diversity, Equity and Inclusion 2001 states that diverse teams perform better, boost leadership integrity, heighten trust in the organization's management and multiply revenue growth. So this article currently goes on to say, for the past few years, what we have become is not completely inclusive, but we are making use of this word in random. If you look into the statistics, according to a recent report, nearly 2 million people in India suffer from this neurological and developmental disorder and are therefore identified as autistic. Another study by Deloitte estimates that nearly 20% of the world is neurodiverse. In the United States of America, it is estimated that 85% of the people on autism spectrum are unemployed compared to 4.2% of the overall population. So this article basically goes on to say that we have to add such people into the work culture. Why? That is because organizations embracing neurodiversity enjoy a competitive edge in several areas such as efficiency, creativity and culture. Moreover, studies have also shown teams with both neurodivergent and neurotypical members are far more efficient than teams that comprise of the neurotypical employees alone and neurodivergent individuals possess excellent attention to detail and have an uncanny ability to focus on complex and repetitive tasks which others may not have over a more extended period than their neurotypical peers. So this article says that such people will have to be brought into the work culture so that they are given an employment opportunities and it truly represents the inclusive form. So what is the way forward? Human resources and leadership teams must work together to ensure that the workplace is cooperative towards neurodiverse individuals. This basically means the process of building an inclusive culture includes customizing the interviews, ensuring day-to-day -day assistance to these people and providing proper infrastructure so that these individuals can perform at the optimal levels. Then we have the mentorship programs which can benefit some while others might require professional training 
on shared social and communication skills many employees with a neurodiversity may find it really tough to adapt in the work culture so these neurodivergent friendly officers will have to cater to the employees diverse sensory responses and they have to make sure that these people feel comfortable in the office premises so this article currently goes on to say that these individuals will have to be identified and organizations will have to create a more accommodating environment is what is this article all about now let's look into the main practice questions critically evaluate the draft indian telecommunication bill 2022 next question explain how states are increasingly using sports mega events as part of their soft power strategies please write all your answers on the comment section peer review and do give positive feedback to your friends answers so this is it for today thank you for watching all the best